I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 is our text. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you and you're in the room here at Sweetwater, then I'm going to encourage you to grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,166. And you will find Philippians 4, be able to follow along. If you're joining us uh, at our Parker campus, there's a table in the back with Bibles on it. Uh, run back there and grab one of those Bibles right now. Turn to page 1,166. And by the way, speaking of our Parker campus, you guys had a phenomenal week down there with Vacation Bible School. And I just want to give a shout out to the, uh, the workers who, were do who made it possible. Uh, we had uh, 11 of our teens that were helping out, 13 adults for 38 kids, and here's the best part, eight decisions for Christ among those kids. Isn't that awesome? You guys, we are celebrating with you and praying for you for that follow-up and the lives that are being changed there in Parker. Hey, if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and, uh, and you need one or want one, then please uh, let us know. Email us, contact us, we'll get you a Bible, we'll mail one to you, we'll deliver one to you. And if you're in the room, either at Sweetwater or at Parker, then uh, just take one of those with you. If you need a Bible, take one with you. We want you to have God's Word, read God's Word, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, while I'm acknowledging our online campus, uh, then uh, just know that right now is a great time for you to go and grab your communion elements. If you haven't already done that, we're going to be celebrating communion later in the service. We'd love for you to join with us in doing that. So go grab you some uh, crackers, some bread, some juice, some wine, whatever you have that you can use as those elements to remember Jesus' death and resurrection. Hey, uh, last week we talked about joy, and we agreed that we all want more joy. And, uh, and, and this week we're talking about that other attribute that is in short supply, the one that everyone wants more of. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, some of you got it, peace. We're talking about peace. Because, uh, you know, think about it. I think about all the times that people say, I just want some peace and... Oh, you guys all know that, huh? You want it too. Some of you right now are fantasizing about sitting on a beach in a beach chair uh, and just watching the waves come rolling in. You want to confess? Anyone confessing there? Okay, I got your hands. I see those hands. Uh, parents, parents want peace. That's why they're always gently and kindly saying to their children, stop fighting! Because, <laughs> you know, that always brings peace about right in that moment. Uh, and of course, throughout history, we love songs about peace. Right? Some of you are children of the 60s, and so the answer, my friend, was blowing in the wind. <laughs> right? Some of you grew up on John Lennon's Imagine, which, if you listen to the lyrics, is not appealing at all. And then, of course, some of you grew up on the Eagles, because they had a peaceful, easy feeling. <laughs> some of you grew up in church singing, I got peace like a river, which was a lie in most churches. Uh, well, if you want more peace and you'd like to have joy in your life, then today's passage is for you. Because we're looking at Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7, and it starts with joy and ends with peace. The only problem is there's some anxiety in between. So let's look at this passage and then talk about this process to peace. The Apostle Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a beautiful passage, isn't it? I, I love this passage. We desperately want peace, but the apostle acknowledges we are plagued by anxiety. We worry. Hey, let's confess again. Who excels at worrying? Okay. I, I, I see those hands too. Uh, see, we do. We, we excel at worrying. We worry about health. We worry about our health. We worry about our spouse's health. 
I'm not going to ask you to confess this one because I can just imagine the, the looks that would happen right now. But some of you uh, pretty much nag your spouse. I'm not going to say it was husband or wife. You nag your spouse about uh, you need to take your vitamins. You need to do this. Don't eat that. Uh, stop doing that. Get some exercise. All those kinds of things because you're worried about their health. Some of you are worried about your parents' health. Some of you are worried about your kids' health. We worry about money. What's the economy going to do? You know, is the housing prices going to continue to go up? Are they going to go down? What about jobs? What about raise? I need a raise. What about the bills? I got to pay the bills. How am I going to pay the bills? I need a new car. How am I going to afford a new car? All this kind of stuff. We worry about money. We worry about relationships. What did they mean when they said that? What are they thinking? Are they going to stay? Or are they going to leave? We worry about vanity, we worry about vacations, we worry about parties, we worry about sports. We worry about politics. We worry about wars and terrorism and pandemics. We are, actually what we have is a pandemic of worry, if you really wanna know. We worry, and, and yet we in the, in, in the body of Christ, look, and this is especially addressing those of you who call yourselves Christians, okay? So if you're a follower of Jesus, you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world. You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. He's your champion. You believe he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Then you, you should care that Jesus said this when it comes to worry. Luke 12, he said, And which of you, by being anxious can add a single hour to a span of life? Anyone? Anyone? No, there's no, no one of us can. He says, if then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? That's Jesus. That's our Savior. That's our champion. Who said, look, worrying doesn't help a thing. Of course, the Apostle Paul was a little more blunt because I just read it a moment ago, right? Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Got it? Good. I can go home now. Yeah. Doesn't really work that way, does it? Because you know that. Every one of us knows that worry doesn't help and it doesn't change anything except that when we worry, we have less joy and it kills our peace. That's what worry does. It worry steals our joy and kills our peace. So what are we to do? Well, we got to listen to Jesus and we got to learn the process to peace laid out by the Apostle Paul in these verses. Now, honestly, when I was writing this, I wanted to say the path to peace, except, you know, a lot of us go on hikes and stuff. You take a path someplace and you get there and you go, okay, I made it to my destination. I'm done. And, and that's not what this process is like. This process really needs to be part of your life until the day you meet Jesus face to face. Okay, this needs to be incorporated into our lives as a habit so that we, we do it over and over and over again. So we're going to talk about the process to peace. But before we do that, uh, look, all of us struggle with worry at some level. Okay, everybody in this room has things they worry about. But some suffer from clinical anxiety or depression. It's a physical condition that affects your mind. Okay? Now, if you are under a doctor's care, please keep taking your prescription meds. And if you're seeing a counselor, please continue seeing a counselor. The process to peace will help everyone. But look, I'm going to be honest. You may still need anxiety or depression meds to function in a healthy way. And I think all of us are nuts, so we all need counseling. Uh, so that's, that just goes without saying. So the process. Let's talk about the process to peace. Because the process begins with in everything. See, in everything, the process is how we live. Look again at verse 6. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. In everything. Notice he doesn't say, sometimes do this. When you're in crisis, do this. When you're struggling or in an emergency, then you need to revert to this process of peace. In other words, when you have anxiety, break glass. No, that's not what Paul's saying. He's saying this exists for always, at all times, in everything, daily, hourly. Be mindful of this process that we're going to talk about. This needs to be built into your life. So my hope is that starting today, every time you start to worry, that you will think of and practice the process to peace. 
Okay, that, 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 I'm just being honest with you. This is not something that I wish to listen to this sermon. I got this good sermon. Leave here and never do anything with it. I actually want you to walk out of here uh, and, and, and have something that you go, okay, I'm starting to worry. I need to go back to this process. And you work this into your life. And some of you will do that and you'll see a change because your life will have more joy and more peace in it. And some of you will just go home and continue worrying and think, what did he say? It doesn't matter. I wasn't listening to him anyway. So... That's my hope. That's my hope for you. That's my goal in, in sharing this with you. This is the Word of God, and we believe that if you read the Word of God and apply it to your life, God will change your life. So this is the point of change at the point of peace. So in everything is where it begins. The process is how we live. So in everything, we are to pray. Where to pray? Look what he says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Time with God changes everything. Let me say it again. Time with God changes everything. So in everything, pray. Now, I love it because the apostle says, in everything by prayer and supplication, which, which is really a certain type of prayer. The word supplication is not used a whole lot, but actually we supplicate often, and, and uh, we have that in our lives often, because supplication is the fancy word for begging desperately begging. So if you have children, you experience supplication all the time as a parent, right? When you say, no, you can't have dessert and your child wants dessert and they keep asking, 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 that is supplication. When there are tears and whining and begging, that is supplication. We're talking about desperate prayer. Paul says, hey, in everything you need to pray and desperately beg God. So if you want your worry to decrease, if you want your worry not to control you, spend time with God. Pray. More time with God usually equates to more peace from God. Now notice I use the word usually because if you're actively living in rebellion, spending time with God becomes very uncomfortable because there's this thing called conviction because the Holy Spirit's gonna remind you of the way you're rebelling and he wants you to repent. And until you repent, you're not gonna have any peace. But if you are seeking God, if you're trying to live for God, if you're trying to please God, then spending time with him is gonna result in more peace. And, and here's one of the problems. We are taught to have a quiet time as our prayer time. I'm not going to ask you to confess how many of you have a, a regular quiet time because I don't want you to lie in church. But because uh, that's what we did when we were growing up. We were taught to have a quiet time and we always pretended like we had one even when we didn't. Look, quiet times are awesome. You should have a quiet time. Spend some time every day intentionally where you read your devotion, you read your Bible, you pray for a few minutes, you get your day started. Okay, that's, that's a great way to start. But the problem is that's where a lot of us stop. Okay, God, I checked the box. I spent some time with you. See you tomorrow. See, what we need to do is have that quiet time, read the devotion, read the Bible, pray, and then keep praying as we go. Continue to pray. In fact, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Thessalonica, he said, Thessaloniki, he said uh, this, pray continually. Pray without ceasing. Some of you probably may have heard it in the King James. Pray, just always pray. Always be praying. How do you do that? Obviously, it's not like on your knees with your eyes closed. Otherwise, it's really difficult to drive. But uh, how do we do this? Look, this is just acknowledging that God is with you always, and you talk to him. You have a conversation with him. Uh, I confess, I like to talk to God out loud whenever I'm alone, or when I think I'm alone, which is really awkward sometimes. Because <laughs> people will walk in and go, who are you talking to? There's nobody here. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm praying. It's really awkward in the men's room, okay? Can I just tell you that? <laughs> Suddenly someone walks out of the stall and you're like, I'm not crazy. Just looks that way. Look, just have a conversation with God. God knows what is happening in your life. God is listening to the conversations that you are, are having that are causing you stress or causing you worry. He already knows that you're kind of freaking out about some stuff. So why don't you just go ahead and include God in the conversation and talk to God about that. Talk to God about how you're feeling, about what you're thinking. That's what it means to pray continually. Just include God in your day as you're going through your day, which will bring you to repent a lot faster when you're angry in traffic, okay? So 
See, our problem is that we know about prayer. We just don't pray much, except when we're in crisis, right? When we're in crisis, when our world's falling apart, we're on our knees, we're begging God. Then we get to that whole supplication thing, right? And we're asking God when we're in crisis. If you want to have peace, then make that kind of prayer your normal activity in your life. Spend more time with God. Make prayer a priority. And, and some of you are going, look, I, I want to pray. I just don't know how to pray. That's okay. There's a lot of people who don't know how to pray. That's why Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. That's why the Lord's Prayer is a model prayer. It's not the prayer to pray all the time. It's an example prayer. But here's the thing. If you don't know how to pray and you want to pray, ask God to teach you how to pray and then try praying. And if you still need some more instruction, you know, make an appointment with one of the pastors. We'll be glad to, to, to offer up some insights and, and help you figure it out. See, but you just gotta try praying. And, and when you make prayer a priority, then you're gonna get closer to God and closeness to God changes everything. Let me say that again. Closeness to God changes everything, especially when it comes to peace because proximity is more important than knowledge. Let me say that again. Proximity, if you're going to write something, it's not in your notes, but if you're going to write something cool down, proximity is more important than knowledge. Be, okay, closeness matters more than information. Let me share an illustration with you that was shared with me, and it makes perfect sense because it applies to my life perfectly. Uh, how many of you, uh, when you're driving, especially on the highway, tend to go faster than the posted speed limit? Okay. I confess, I do too, okay? I drive fast. I don't drive crazy fast. I don't drive reckless fast. Uh, some of you might think so, but I don't. Um, I'm a 10 over kind of fast driver, all right? And I set cruise because I like to have a driver's license. And so uh, I'll, I'll drive fast. And, you know, and the only time I generally slow down is when someone's driving slower than me in the fast lane, in which case I pray for them. And uh, I do. I stopped yelling and I just asked them, you know, God to help them move. So, uh, now, this is not an information issue because I can read the speed limit signs. I understand what the posted speed limit is. I am uh, quite <laughs> comfortable with and, and, and uh, experienced with the consequences for exceeding said speed limit. But I still don't slow down. Now, when do you think I slow down? Right, when there is law enforcement nearby. Look, you, you know when my heart grieves is when, you know, uh, an officer merges onto the freeway and, and, and you see him come on and you're like, ah, I have to slow down now as long as they're on the freeway and you're just driving with them. Match. So I praise God for police officers who drive fast too. So, uh, <laughs> see, you guys all relate to that because you understand it. Proximity impacts us more than knowledge does. And some of us know about God and we know about prayer. We know a lot about the Bible. We even know theology and we can debate it and discuss it. But we're not living lives close to God. So let me just give you some practical prayer ideas beyond having a quiet time. And if you don't have a quiet time, start there. Just read a devotion, read some scripture, talk to God. But, but beyond the quiet time, how about doing this? Here's just some ideas. You might want to jot these down if you want to get closer to God. Set aside an hour a week for prayer. Make a lunch date with God. You can be dinner or breakfast, I don't care. But just, you know, make a date with God and say, God, this is going to be your hour, and all I'm going to do is pray with you during that hour. Uh, or take it up a notch, set aside a day for prayer and fasting. You can do your normal day, your normal activities, just instead of eating, when you were, would be eating, just Pull out your Bible and read and pray. Just do that. Or, or if you get serious about it, plan a day of prayer and, and get alone and drive to a park someplace or someplace you can be alone and, and you know, worship to the, to the music in your car on the way there and then walk and, and talk with God and pray. Uh, and some of you are going, what do you do for an hour or more praying? I can't even imagine praying that long. Well, here's some things. Again, if you're writing some notes down, take these notes. If you want to pray for an hour or more, then pray for every person that you know by name. Pray for every person you know. Start with your family, then pray for your friends, and then pray for your, your coworkers, and pray for your neighbors, and then pray for the people you don't like. Especially pray for the people you don't like. 
And, you know, and after you get done praying for all of them, then tell God what you're struggling with. Tell God what you're worrying about. He already knows, but talk to him about it. And then after you do that, then sing praises. Journal, write down how you're feeling. Read the Bible. And say thank you for every single blessing that you can think of. Write them down. I dare you to. It'll amaze you. And an hour, you, won't have, you won't be able to do all that in an hour. It'll take way longer than an hour to do that. So say thank you for all your blessings, which leads us to the next step in the process. The next step in the process is bring requests with gratitude. Bring requests with, with gratitude. Continue on. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. With thanksgiving. This is an important step. It's easy to bring requests to God, but a lot of times we bring requests to God with the wrong attitude. Sometimes we bring our requests with complaining. This hurts me. God, why is this happening to me? Why me? I know you guys have never done that, but I've heard people do that. Sometimes we bring, you know, our requests to God with accusation. God, if you love me, then why is this happening? God, if you loved me, you wouldn't have allowed this to happen. Sometimes we bring requests with demand, right? There's actually some churches that say, well, if you pray in Jesus' name, then God has to give it to you, and so you demand it from God. It's not gonna work. Don't try that. Ask with gratitude, with thanksgiving. Ask in the awareness and the reflection of all the blessings that God has already poured out into your life even if it hurts, even if you're broken, even if you're scared, even if you're worried about how it's going to turn out, just thank God for his love and his care and his provision. Thank God for salvation, for the fact that he's forgiven you of all your sins. He's adopted you as sons and daughters of God, and he's promised you heaven, which, by the way, you don't deserve. Thank God for all the relationships that bless you in your life, for, for the redemption of your life, for, for being able to use your life now to serve others in the name of Jesus. And here's the thing. Be grateful before you ask. Changes the way we ask. Be grateful before you ask. And then here's the thing. Be grateful if God answers yes to your prayer. It's pretty easy to do. Sometimes we forget, though. Be grateful when God says no or wait. Oh, we don't like that. We suddenly turn into a bunch of two-year-olds throwing a temper tantrum, don't we? Because we didn't get what we wanted. No, be grateful. Because when you're grateful when God says no, that means that you're trusting God. You're saying, God, I trust you and I'm bringing this to you and I don't have to worry about it, but I'm, I'm giving it to you. So thank you. And then just be gratefully aware of God's blessings all the time. You see, if we increase our time with God, bringing our requests with gratitude in everything, then the promise becomes a reality, and the promise is that peace will guard your life. Right? He, he continues on. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Understand, God is promising a crazy, irrational peace. It's a peace that doesn't make sense to people from the outside. It's a peace that does not make sense to people who do not understand the relationship you have with Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't mean that you won't worry. It doesn't mean that you won't feel anxious. It doesn't mean that you won't feel afraid. But as you practice the process, peace will flow into your life. Look, it might begin as just a, a, a little drip drip, drip. It'll grow into a steady flow and some, you know, eventually the faucet will be on and then it's going to be like a hose blasting your life and then pretty soon it's going to be like a river flowing through your life. And some of you are like, I want the river, but it starts with the drip. Okay, you got to start the process. Some of you are like, I want the peace. I don't want the process. Not going to happen. You might have it for a moment, but if you want it in your life, if you want it filling your life, then you got to walk this process. And, and as you practice the process, then uh, you'll still be tempted to worry. But, but when you're close to God and you're talking with God 
He will remind you or teach you his truths. Let me just walk you through this. So maybe you'll be worried about money. And God will remind you what Philippians, this is all in Philippians, by the way. Philippians 4.19 says, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Or maybe you'll be worried about your salvation. Am I really gonna make it to heaven? Am I really good enough? No, you're not, but that's okay. Philippians 1.6 says, uh, we know this, that, that God will complete the work that he started in you. We have all confidence in this. Or maybe you're worried about losing your stuff or about I need to get stuff. And, and in chapter three, verse eight, the apostle says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I count it all as loss. Or, or maybe you're worried about your image or your status or your vanity. <laughs> Philippians 3, 8 says, I count everything as loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. Maybe you're worried about this nation and the politics and what's going on and what's gonna happen to the United States of America. And, oh my goodness, look what's going on. Philippians 3, 20 says, for our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you're worried about purpose. You're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I want my life to count. Great, Philippians 2 verse 3 says, uh, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but rather with humility of mind, consider others more important than yourself. Don't look after your, just your own interests, but also the interests of others. Or maybe you're terrified about death. And you're like, I don't want to die. I'm afraid of dying. I'm afraid of what's involved in dying. Then listen to the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1, 21, when he says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's better. It's, it's an upgrade. You see, all of this are things that we worry about and yet God wants to say, hey, look, trust me. I've spoken to you about this. I've given you promises about this. I'm with you in this. And and. And look, it'll visit peace into your life. But you gotta work the steps. You gotta walk the process. You gotta make it part of your life over and over and over again. Because as you begin to live a life trusting God more because you know from experience that his promises are true, you may not get what you want in the moment, but ultimately, you're gonna know that we win, that you are loved, and that heaven is your destiny. And peace will reign in your life. I hope that helps you increase your joy and I hope it helps you live in peace. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for the grace that you give us. You know that we can trust you. We know that we can trust you, but it's so hard for us to do it in the moment, in the real moments of life when life gets stressful and frightening and scary. God, we well, you know, we freak out. We stop trusting you. We doubt. We question. We worry. To no avail. So, Father, meet us tonight in our panic and our anxiety and our frustration and our fears and visit peace on us because you are real and your peace is real. But, God, we want more than just a moment of peace with you. We want to, to learn to walk with you, to hear your voice, to talk with you, to prioritize you so that your peace will flow into our lives. So meet us tonight and change us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.